All right, guys. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you guys have a good weekend. Uh, so this is our basically last lecture before the review. I might start with a review today. We'll see. Okay. Uh, what I want to introduce today is just the idea of wave optics, uh, which has to do with interference and diffraction. All right. Um, now, there are a few questions about the final exam sample. Uh, remember that any topic that normally is only two topics, uh, quantum physics and nuclear physics that we didn't cover, uh, that won't be on the exam. But the exam will be everything we have covered in class. I'm talking about the final right now, okay? And uh, it's fair to say that 95% of the exam is gonna be topics up until optics or even 88% um, of the exam, right? So um, since, there is, since there are a lot of topics to review, I might start with uh, probably reviewing a couple of the problems from the exam, okay, from the exam on, on Thursday. But tomorrow is where I will do most of the review especially on the first topics, right? Circuits, electrostatics, uh, magnetism, right? Uh, remember that it would be a good idea to have uh, an equation sheet next to you, all right? And some of the constants, even though most of them will be given on the exam, all right? Remember that the final exam is 30 questions, not 60. So that sample one was from like three years ago, I believe, so it's different. Plus that was departmental, right? During the summer and even next semester in the, in the fall because of the uh, circumstances we're going through right now, the exam won't be departmental, right? So it won't be a common exam across sections, uh, which is good because then each professor can make their own exam based on uh, the topics they have reached, right? But normally we get to this chapter, chapter 28, which is the last topic on optics. Um, and it's quite simple. Uh, the concept is, uh, is what we have to go through. That's it. Uh, I also open it, and remember it's not mandatory, but I opened it the last homework, homework 15 yesterday. So you can take it to practice about near point, far, uh, far sighted, near sighted people, and magnification, all right? So it's a good idea if you wanna go and review that. Um, I've been updating the grades on the homework. Remember that I'm dropping the free uh, lowest grades. So if you have some zeros there, they are most likely not gonna affect your grade, all right? Because they are being dropped automatically by the system. I just have to put a grade in them, all right? Um, now, if you need extensions, that's another way around it. Like, if you feel like you're running out of time and some people have already done it, you can request for an extension via website. And then you can be, and then you will be automatically granted one. All right? So that is if you want to keep working on the assignments, especially the last two or three assignments. All right? But I believe some of them are due between tomorrow and Wednesday, right? So it would be a good idea if you start, well, I think most of you have finished them, so that's good. But um, if you wanna get access to them again, just let me know, all right? Uh, so that's with the assignments. So let's just start with this topic. Uh, let's just share the screen now. So. Uh, 12 homeworks, right? Uh, no, 11 homeworks. You need to complete 11 homeworks, right? Because I'm dropping the free lowest grade, so 14 homeworks are mandatory. 11 are the ones that you need to complete. So if you complete 11 homeworks, you'll be more than fine. All right? At least for the homework grade part, right? Um, okay. So let's... Yeah, it's been recorded. All right, so the last chapter that we're gonna cover, or the last topic, not chapter per se, is wave optics. All right, so I'm gonna be using a few animations for this chapter, all right, and a few graphs, because 
To understand wave optics, we need to go back to the idea of light being a wave. So when we introduce lenses, mirrors, reflection and refraction, we started by introducing the wavefronts and the rays perpendicular to the wavefronts, right? Like when you throw a stone on a pond and then you see the waves coming from it on the epicenter. Uh, for convenience, we've been using just rays and it's been easy for us to uh, look at the trajectory of light, the path as it reflects or refracts, uh, or when it goes through a lens or when it reflects on a mirror. But what happens when you have two waves either acting from, for example, radio antennas, all right? Uh, in astronomy, on radio astronomy, we use uh, radio dishes like that to form what we know as interferometry. Interferometry is the idea of collecting the signal using two or more radio antennas, right? And using a correlator and a whole bunch of processes, of course, we're able to compose an image of certain parts of the universe, a galaxy, a star cluster, right? So the information can actually be gathered by more than one antenna, right? Instead of just having one like the one in Arecibo, very big, right? You can have like a set of radio antennas like the one in New Mexico, right? And then if they point at the same source, the only thing you have to worry about is the different on path lengths, right? Uh, if you remember from waves, mechanical waves, uh, there are two things that can happen when they interfere. There can be the constructing interference or the destructive interference. When two waves collide with each other or they converge, the amplitude can increase or it can totally decrease. It can become zero. So that's when it becomes destructive, right? So that happens with waves, radio waves, uh, sound waves, and mechanical waves, right? But radio waves are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we expect that to happen with any part of light, like radio, microwave, and visible light. So the way we like to do this experiment in the lab is by using this. Okay, so right now you have a laser pointer, right? Uh, you have, let's first do one slip. So you see one time. If you have a very small slit, 200 nanometers separation or width of this slit, then as light gets through here, you start seeing these waves being formed. Now, that was something that was like the final proof for scientists back in the 18th, 19th century to realize that light was a wave. Why? Because we know water, water waves, right? Like the ones that you see in the ocean. So this is what happens with water, right? When you have a water generator, that's normal, right? Let me actually change the frequency there. Amplitude matter. So as water goes through this lid, right, you see waves forming. And if you have two slits, then you see two set of waves, and then they interfere. That's actually that we were used to, to, to see with, with water. If you have sound, sound waves also produce the same. Right, you see the sound wave there when you are, for example, sound is going from one room to another room. That's how sound gets right from one place to another. And then you can have two slits. So, so far, that's what we knew that was going on, right? But with light, we all the same. So that was the final evidence to realize that light behaves as a wave, right? So then Thomas Young came into the picture and he said, well, let's put two slits and let's see if what happens with water and sound happens with light. And he 
place two slits at some distance from the light generator. He turned it on, and then he saw light going through the slits. And as they went farther from the slits, he started to see interfering pattern. An interfering pattern that now we call them as dark and bright fringes. That's John double slit experiment. I'm pretty sure maybe in chemistry you have talked about this, but if you haven't, there you are, right? That's basically what he observed. As light goes from one and then two slits, you see this effect. This you will see with water and with sound, especially with water. We expected this, but with light, it was surprising to see this. And it will be more surprising to see this with a stream of photons. What do we mean by that? For example, a stream of electrons. Uh, this experiment was repeated with uh, high energy particles, right? And we saw the same. So that's the idea of light behaving as a wave and as a particle, and also particles having a wave behavior, right? We're getting right now into sort of an introduction to quantum physics, right? The idea of quantum physics is that reality doesn't behave the same in the quantum world, right? Uh, we're talking about subatomic particles. Um, so in, that was the principle. Right, that was the first idea, the fact, the fact that light behaves as a wave, but we know light also, from Albert Einstein, we know that light also has a particle behavior, right? So that's what we call it, the dual behavior of light. Anyway, so as light goes from one antenna and this antenna towards a, what we're gonna call this a screen, this screen here, or in here in the animation, the screen will be here. Um, there are points of constructive and destructive interference. Take a look at the bright fronts here, but you also see in between the dark fronts in there. Why some of them are green, some of them are black. And it's like this, right? Green, black, green, black, green, black. That's what you wanna see here on the screen. You're gonna see green fringes, and in between you're gonna see dark fringes. Why does that happen? It happens because the waves, they have two waves of interference. They can interfere, they can have a constructive interference or a destructive interference. When do we know if they have constructive or destructive? That's basically the same principle as we had in uh, mechanical waves. So depending on the wavelength of light and depending on the path difference. This antenna and this antenna, as you can see, for example, let's take a look at Q2. For Q2, the length for this antenna here is longer than from this antenna here. And if we go to a point here, for example, the length will be longer for this one and for this one. And how do we find the difference on path? We use geometry. Right? And then we define an angle theta. That angle theta is what gives us a path difference. Right? So by knowing that path difference and by knowing the conditions for interference, which are given here, constructive and destructive, we can combine them and have our, our equations for the double slit experiment and for the interference of light. All right? So pretty much what you're seeing here is that the path difference is d sine theta. d sine theta can be equals to m lambda, that will give you the constructive interference, or can be equals to n minus one half or m plus one half lambda. Uh, there are two conditions for the destructive interference. That's because you can be above or below the center. All right? I will draw that so it makes it, it, it's more clear what I'm talking about right now. But M is the order of interference. So how does this work? 
right? So let's draw the picture on the board so you can see it. So the way constructive interference works for the double SD experiment at least is that you can have two slips I'm gonna exaggerate with the difference, by the way, with the width. They are normally very uh, narrow, and the difference here is also very small. But regardless, you will have light coming through, right? And as light goes through, from this central, we draw this axis, this line. And here we have the screen. So that's your screen there. Normally, there is a separation, we call this D. So when light goes, now you know, or now you've seen, that light can interfere toward this point, and toward this point. That point, like that, right? If this is a small d, right? This is the angle theta. Then the path difference is d sine theta. In any case, the pattern that we see here, now we know, is we see some bright, Fringes, and we see some dark in between, right? This is called the order zero. Here is when you have m equals to one, m equals to two, and three and four. So in the middle, you need to have something that is in the middle. So here will be the order one half. Here will be the order three half. That's why for destructive interference, you have that a small d sine of theta is equal to m minus one half lambda. M is the order, so the order can also, it's always gonna be the first fringe, the second fringe, right? So M is not gonna be one half, but one minus one half gives you that. Two minus one half gives you, give you that, all right? For constructive, we don't have to worry about in between, is the bright fringe, so the path difference is just equals to m lambda. And m can be one, two, three. It can also be negative. We're not gonna talk about much about the negative, but they happen below the, uh, below the central maximum. So this is the central, and below that, that's when you have the negative one. So m, certainly m can be plus minus one, plus minus two, plus, minus, three, and so on. Now, that's basically the main, the, the idea behind diffraction, only these two equations. Now, what other things you can explore? You can explore about the width between the bright or dark fringes, right? And that's using this angle theta and this D. Let's suppose this order is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So this is for order 4. For order 4, using this equation, I can find the angle theta. If I know the separation between the slits, you know the order, and I know the wave, and by the way, something I should have said. The light that hits can be any light. But normally this experiment works better with lasers, so monochromatic light. Uh, normally it has to be either green or red, 
So we're talking about wavelengths in the order of nanometers. So between 400 to 700 nanometers of wavelength. So the wavelength is small, D normally is small, but regardless, the angle theta for the first order is very tiny. And even for order four, can be in some cases below 15 degrees. And we know already, right? We've been using this a lot for angles that are small, we can approximate um, sine theta to be approximately tangent of theta. But that's normally for angles that are small. Maybe for this, it's not that small. So regardless, this is what you can do. From this point, you can always draw that, right? That there is also theta, by the way, all right? So if you have D, right? If you're given this distance between the slits on the screen and you find this angle using this equation, then you can find this separation between the axis and the fourth order. That will be called Y. And that Y is equal to D tangent of theta. All right. Now, why do we need that? Because sometimes if I know that, then I can do the same for every order. And I can know the separation between the bright fringes. I can do the same with the dark. All right? Uh, so that's basically the idea with interference. It's light, monochromatic light, going through very narrow slits, not separated, just a little bit separated, and then interfering on the screen. This is John WSD experiment, and this helps us to prove that light behaves as a wave, this is a wave behavior, interference there happening, and that you can evaluate differences uh, between dark and bright fringes. Later on, then we introduce the idea of diffraction. Diffraction is just when you remove one of the slits and you have just one narrow slit and light goes, like I show you in the one SD experiment, it goes and it diffracts, it disperses. You have the same, but now instead of D, you have a W there, where W will be the width of the, of the slit, all right? The main difference between diffraction and interference is that in diffraction, you use something called and that's probably something that you saw that we were going to do. It's very hard to do it online. But in the lab, normally what we have is uh, diffracting gradients. Diffracting gradients are devices, rectangular devices, that you use to break light into components, like the prism that I show you in those uh, refraction problems, and light disperses into the rainbow colors. That's basically what a diffracting gradient does light gets dispersed, diffracted in there, right? And then you see, it's basically the idea behind a rainbow, right? When you see a rainbow on the sky, it's because light is being diffracted and refracted, of course, uh, through wave drops, uh, through water drops, right? When the environment is very humid, when there has been rain. And then that diffraction produces a rainbow. Right? That's why normally we see a rainbow happening in a sunny day when there has been rain or when there is rain and sun at the same time. Right? So light is refracted, refracted, diffracted, sorry, uh, through the rain and then you see that uh, happening, right? So basically the water, right, the rain there is acting as a diffracting rain. Right? So let's let me show you a little bit of that. In here. Yes, sir, what is lambda? Lambda is the wavelength of light. Thank you. 
right? Lambda is the wavelength of light. So remember that when that comes from electromagnetic waves, right? When we discuss about um, light having a period, a frequency, a speed, you also have a wavelength, the distance between, between the, the crests. Uh, okay, so here's the idea of diffraction, right? You only have one slit, and you also have the bright and the dark fringes. So the same idea with the path length, and you have the equation for uh, diffraction, the general equation there, right? But the main idea behind this is when you have uh, the diffracting grating, right? And the diffracting grating is a device that comes in terms of lines per millimeter. So, let's erase this. And let's just show you what a diffracting grating is. It's a rectangular, so for diffraction. The diffracting grating has, it has hundreds or thousands of lines. Those are like divisions. So when light goes through here, there gets diffracted, right? So this normally comes as a form of an end. It can be, let's say, um, let's make it easy, 500. Lines per millimeter. In one millimeter, there's 500 lines. A lot, right? Uh, you can have even more. So, for the equation of interference, we have this. Since you only have one slit, there is no destructive anymore or constructive. It's just this. Uh, this can also be W in the slides, but most of the books, they use, again, D. D will be the width of the slit. So this is the equation for diffraction. All right. So if I'm doing diffracting gradients, how do I use this to get this? The order? I can say the first order, the second order, there. Lambda here can be around 600 nanometers. So I have lambda. So I want to find the angle, right? That light is going to be refracted on the first order, for example. So there is a relationship. We want to know the width in millimeters. So D is basically one over N, which is pretty much one over 500, but this is millimeters. We need to change this to meters. So there are a thousand millimeters in one meter, right? So this will be times 10 to the negative three meters. Yeah. So this will be 0 0.2 times 10 to the minus five, two times 10 to the negative six. Yes. So that will be your D. Then you can use that and solve the problem. All right. So a diffracting grading 
always comes with this value. They have to give you the number of lines per millimeter. All right? That's a very in, uh, interesting experiment that you can do in a lab setting, all right? A diffraction experiment. Normally, what you use for that is also a telescope device. We call it a telescope because what we use is the eyepiece. And then you look at the screen, and then you can see at the different orders, the different, so basically white light going through this guy, and then you see the rainbow being formed. The first order, the second order, and so on. Obviously, as you would expect, the higher the order, the less visible it becomes, right? It's like when light interferes, right? The first orders, uh, let's actually show you with a graph what do I mean by that. Uh, here, next week. So another way to quantify this All right, another way to quantify uh, this, all right, is by doing the, uh, the graph of diffraction and interference. So there, you can still see that. So here, all this can be simplified if you have the grading here. Right in here. I have the screen. This is your screen. Um, you have the maxima here, and then you have. That's the other maximas. The maxima, we graph it, right? The way we illustrate it is by having this. We call that a central maxima. And like this, and like this, and like this. So the same here. This one is the one that you can observe very clearly, very neat. As you go farther from the central, you start seeing less amplitudes. That is actually a very characteristic graph of both diffraction and interference. All right? So it's a very unique type of graph. Uh, the simplification is just by using the bright and dark fringes, right? At the end of the day, what you need to remember is the equation, right? Always, d sine theta equals for diffraction is just this. Where if you have a gradient, so if you're giving a diffracting gradient, this D is the inverse of the number of lines per millimeter or per centimeter. It depends on what they tell you. And that's how you convert it. So 500 lines per millimeter, you do the inverse, and then you change it to meters. And that's it. So, Let's just do a couple of examples so you know what I'm talking about here. All right, so you can see how this applies. Um, again, the only situation will be to identify the angles, or most of the situations will, will be to identify the angles of diffraction or interference, depending on the order given and the wavelength given. All right, so let's take a look here. Um, this one is good. You don't always have to graph it, by the way, but it helps. Right? In a problem like this, it helps, but 
a typical problem will be giving you a double SD experiment where the wavelength of light is 500 nanometers. So in a double slit experiment, the wavelength of light is 500 nanometers. So that's what they have to give you. And they tell you that the first bright fringe, right, so the first bright fringe is uh, theta equals to 17 degrees. So let's find the separation between the slits, right? You don't have to graph it. I mean, we know how it looks. First bright fringe means that you want to use this equation. A small d sine of theta equals to m lambda. This is constructed. That's what you need to know. Right? And we know it's that because it's bright. If they were telling you that, you will have to use the minus or plus one half. Right? In 1D, we have lambda and we have the angle and m first, that's one. Right? So m for m is equal to one, then we do d sine of 17 equals to one times lambda, 500 nanometers, right? We have to change it to meters. So d will be divided by that, right? So 500 um, So 1,710, or oh, 1,710. So that, right? Or we can do this, one, two, three, 1.71 times 10 to the negative six, or 1.71 micron. So it's small. We're saying that the separation between the slits is in micrometers, very small, right? So this will only be observed as the separation gets more narrow, right? Or it gets very tiny. So that's a good example there, right? Let's take a look at another type of problem here. Right. So as you can see, this is the main equation that we're going to be using. Or if you do the extractive, and I think we have one here, we will do the n minus one half or m plus one half. Now for this one, I'm going to draw it because they give you some extra information like, again, uh, they tell you monochromatic light. You don't know the wavelength in this case, but they tell you that the screen, right, is separated from the slits 1.8 meters, right? And they give you the distance between the slits. So either they give you the wavelength or the distance between the slits, right? So in this case, they give you two set of the slits. There, right? And then you have this distance D, they give you that.
And then 1.8 meters away. So the distance between the slits and the screen can be large, almost two meters. That's fine, right? Uh, they tell you that the first and second order bright fringes, all right, so that's good. So the first order and the second order bright fringes are separated by 0.55 millimeters. So this is order one, order two. And we know that as light hits here, Right? A slight hit there. Then we're going to have this. Like that. And like that. Why am I drawing it? Because you have two angles. Theta 1. Theta 2. We have this, and we're also given the separation between the slits. The separation between the slits are 2.13 millimeters. So in this case, not that much. 2.13 Makes sense because look at this, right? If this is millimeters, this cannot be micrometers or shorter, right? So there you are, or smaller, sorry. Um, What's the wavelength of light? So you want to find lambda in this case. Since this is bright fringes, we know the equation we have to use is there. Right? We have to use that. Constructive interference. For order one, I have this. M lambda. For order two, I have this. But I have this, I don't have lambdas, I don't have thetas. But I have this, and let's take a look. I can find this, let's call this y1, and I can find y2. y2 minus y1 is 0.55 millimeters. How do I find y2 using this d? y2 is equal to 1.8 tangent of theta 2. And y1 is 1.8 tangent of theta 1. But what did I say at the beginning, right? That the angles, the angles can be considered to be small, especially for the first and second order. Maybe for orders five, four, and beyond, four, five, and beyond. Maybe that's not a good approximation, but for the first two orders, it's a good one. If the angles are small, then Y2 will be 1.8, not tangent, but sine of theta 2 minus y1 will be 1.8, not tangent, but sine of theta 1. And that's uh, 
And why did I do that? Because I have signs. Sine theta two is two lambda over d. Sine theta one is lambda over d. So two times one, uh, two lambda minus lambda is lambda. So 1.8 lambda over d is equal to that. But what is d? d is 2 point something millimeters. So here, right? Um, 2.13 millimeters times this, divided by 1.8, that's lambda. So, that, that, divided by 1.8, times 10 to a negative 6. Right? How did you get the 2.13? That's given, that's the distance between the slates. Oh, sorry. So that, okay, so that's nice. Look what I get, I get 0. 0.651 times 10 to a negative six. You don't leave it like that. That's another thing that we're going to change, or at least in this chapter. Every wavelength has to be written, because it's monochromatic light in the visible spectrum, has to be written in nanometers. So one, two, three, 651 nanometers. If I multiply by a thousand, I divide this by a thousand. 10 to a negative nine is nanometers, so that's my point. So very important, right? For a small angles, right? So this a little bit that so you can see that. For a small angles, tangent is equal to sine equals to theta. We've done that approximation before. All right. Uh, again. That's okay for the first two or maybe three orders. Beyond that, the problem will be, a, will be harder, right? I mean, you could try and get tangent here, but it will be more messy, right? Uh, regardless, we're getting an acceptable value for the wavelength there, right? 651 nanometers, right? So let's do one diffraction one, and then we can start doing a few corrections on the exam. Uh, let's see if there's a grading here. Oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. When light is diffracted by a diffracting grading that has 2,000 lines per centimeter, at what angle does red light or wavelength are? Okay, so that's a good problem. A diffraction problem will have now, or most of the times, will have a diffracting grading. Okay. So they tell you, White light with wavelength 640 nanometers, so light with wavelengths 640 nanometer is diffracted or spread by a Diffracting grading at 
call it diffraction grading. That's the correct name. With n equals to 2,000 lines per centimeter. Find the angle between, um, find the angle for the first order of the spectrum. When white light is diffracted through a grading, what you will see on the screen is the spectrum of light. Light in red, uh, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, right? Those colors of the rainbow, that's what you will see on the, um, when you go through a diffraction rating. So the equation, so let's say here, Find the angle with uh, of the first order of spectrum. So find the angle for the first order. So remember, for diffraction, either D or W, sine theta equals to m lambda. m is one and lambda is given. So all these are given. We wanna find this. We're also given this, 2,000 lines per centimeter, but d is one over n. When you do that, you get centimeters. It doesn't matter you have hairline, but it doesn't matter. That's centimeters. You have to multiply by 100 centimeters at the bottom. You get one meter. So, you get 0.5 times 10 to a negative 5, 5 times 10 to a negative 6. So I got my value of D. Then I can use this equation. D sine theta equals to M is one, lambda is There you are. So 640 divided by five is 128, but then divided by 1000, 0.128. Right, please divide it. So we want the angle if I apply the inverse sign here, look at the angle I get. I get 7.35 degrees, very small. And that's basically interference and diffraction. All right? That's basically wave optics. That's how we understand. Of course, there are other things, like you can study the path of light through thin films and uh, look at the interference as light goes through different materials, right? So there are applications of this that you can use in real life, all right? Um, but we normally use this and uh, depending on the time after this, we will start introducing the idea of the dual behavior of light and some concepts on quantum physics, right? But don't worry about it. All right, so this is the last learning goal of this course, is to basically come together and understand that light can also be studied as a wave, and it behaves differently. We don't talk about reflection or refraction, 
we're talking about the phenomena. So these are actually the other two phenomena that we were discussing when, we, when I talk about the study of optics, right? We said we're gonna study reflection and refraction, and we did, and applications, but now we introduce the other two ones that are probably more common in daily life, right? A lot of you have probably have heard about the diffraction of light, dispersion, that's dispersion as well, that's also called dispersion. All interference, maybe more with sound, but you now know that it happens with light. And the John WZ experiment is a very nice way to introduce science to young generations, for example, right? At least as when it comes to experiments in the lab, it's an experiment that is not very hard to replicate. If you have a laser pointer and you have a grading, which you can get anywhere nowadays, even in Amazon, you can actually produce a very nice interference pattern on the wall, right? Um, however, in the lab, we do have proper settings, lamps, and gratings to actually take measurements, right? So there is a whole lab on diffraction that, again, will be very, will be very tricky to do online, right? Um, all right, so that's basically that. Uh, let me just show you why this and then <clears throat> Uh, there is a file, I didn't put this on the homework modules, but if you go to uh, files, <clears throat> where you found the final exam sample, there is something called last topics. You click on there and you will find questions about near point, focal points, the opters and all that, but then you start finding questions about interference and diffraction here. So you can do, use them as practice and the answers are there. Uh, some of the problems are about the topics that we're not gonna cover, which are uh, the introduction to quantum mechanics, all right? But the rest is what we've done. So you can always take a look at that, all right? And then I uh, already took out the assignments. This is the final exam. Again, this final exam has 60 questions and you're gonna find more questions about certain topics that what you're gonna find or what you're gonna see on Thursday, right? Uh, so don't get freaked out about it, right? However, a good question that you probably wanna see is a question like this. Right, you see question 36 here, right? Or question 32 there, applications, right? Uh, nothing too difficult. Remember this, every semester we ask a question about this, all right? So I will go over this exam as well. I believe I did question like this in the, in the class and things like this. So let's go over the exam. Uh, I think I should do the, only the prism and the last question. That's the only two questions I saw. There were some confusions. Uh, finance, yeah, exam number two. I wanna ask you everybody something, I mean, it doesn't matter. Uh, something that we have been discussing in the meetings, not just in this uh, college, but in other colleges, I know that you guys have access to this exam, and I know that some students tend to publish exams online. Uh, some professors do mine. I honestly change my exams every semester, but be careful when you share files across your friends, or if you decide to publish exams, for example, in Czech or other forums, all right? Uh, some professors are actually going to start uh, copywriting material, all right? Labs, please do not, if you are doing labs, do not publish them online. They are tracking that. And I'm not the one who is developing those labs. I'm helping, but I'm not the one who is copywriting them. I know all the labs at Middlesex and 
because of all the situation, a lot of colleges, if you guys are not from Middlesex, every college are gonna start doing that uh, with their material because there's a lot of online material now because of this pandemic, right? So for example, this exam, you can easily publish it somewhere, right? Uh, try not to, and if you do it again, I'm probably gonna change this exam a lot. This is not the same exam I gave. I can use the same graph with different questions, right? But be careful, all right? If you decide to share this. Anyway, this question I did in class, right? And I even by mistake put very similar numbers. So the answer was very close to the, what you had on the website. Um, the hint says that you have to use this information to find these angles here. So D naught is 1.4. Right? Yeah. And L is 2.1. So in the question of the fish that I just show you, they gave you the triangles. If you just made them big, you could clearly find the angle of incidence. That's the first angle you wanted to find. The angle of incidence was, so they gave you the normal here. Incidence and incidence. And they did give you D naught and L. That's D naught and that was L. The angle of refraction was, this is the incidence ray, right? This one here, and it was this one. But you have D naught and L. D naught is 1.4. And L was 2.1. The tangent of the theta incidence is L over D. That's how you find the angle of incidence. How do you find the angle of refraction? Using a small slope. And I gave you n, 1.33. 1 times sine of theta i is equal to 1.33 sine of theta i. And then to know the real depth, right? you had to look at where the fish was. So I didn't, ex I exaggerated this a little bit, so let's see where this is. Right? The fish was located around here. That's the upper end, and that's the real location. So you wanted to find this H. But for that, you need this angle, theta r. If you know theta r and you know h, h tangent of theta r, right? That would be the, or yeah, you were given this. This is L. So L over h here. Or yeah, d h tangent of theta r was equal to L or 2.1. And then you will get H around 2.61. If you do the math there, 2.61 meters. All right. So that is a question of upper in position there. All right. That's pretty much what you had to do. 
Remember, the angle of incidence is always respect to the normal. Right? If you have this, then you start messing it up. You have to be careful there. The only problem I saw with the next question was the obtuse angle. So I didn't take many points off, and honestly, I did it by mistake. Because the answer happens to be very similar. So if you guys are one of the lucky ones, then whatever. But if you didn't find the obtuse angle properly, there is no way you will find the accurate value of theta. That's for the glass. That's for the prism question. The light. Goes like this, then goes like this, and then it goes like this. So there are two normals, right? We know this normal goes through there it is. There. A lot of people got this angle missed up. This angle here. Let's find it first. Angle here. 45, 90, normal 90, normal 90, 45. This angle is 135 degrees. All right. There is no way you can get it using triangles, which is what I saw some people doing. I don't know how. I mean, yes, this is 45, and you can get this angle, right? One point fifty two. Sign this is theta, right? Let's call this x. Does anybody remember how much was x? I don't remember. 17, I think. Let me see. Uh, 45. Sign. Twenty-seven point seven. Okay, so this was what? Right. This that one. But to find that you need this, and then you will use triangles to find this angle. Why? So the angle Y by using the obtuse, that's why that was the second part of the, of the question, will be 135, 27.7, and then you subtract 180 from that. 17.3. So this angle was 17.3. And then you will use this to find theta. One side theta, right? So 26.8, so 27 it is approximately. That was the answer. All right, so be careful. You're not gonna get a question like this in the final. The final are more application type of questions, but just in case, all right? Uh, number one, number two were just application of equations. Number four, I did it in class. Number five was, co okay, concave mirrors have positive focal lengths. And convex mirrors have negative focal lengths. So I did take points off for people who wrote them. They found the right lens, 
But for some reasons, they, they wrote down that a concave lens have a negative focality. No. Uh, if you want to magnify an image using a mirror, the only way you can magnify is with a concave lens. A concave mirror. A concave mirror, not always, but can magnify. That's never gonna happen with a convex mirror. Okay, if you guys go to the gym, even though I know it's closed, but uh, if you guys happen to go, or even in the mall, but normally I see this in the gyms, they do have in the lockers, uh, on, on the entrance sometimes, spherical mirrors, right? Or actually, they also have them on the roads for people to, uh, when there is an intersection, so they can see a car coming when it's very narrow. Anyway. That mirror is convex. If you pay attention, the images always in a convex mirror are always smaller. Why? Because then they can see the whole group of people, right? Uh, the objective of those type of mirrors is to see the gathering that is happening at that point, right? The amount of people ending. Um, so they don't look to magnify. They look to make the image smaller so it can fit on the mirror. Right? The objective of, of a mirror is not always to magnify, by the way. It depends on the usage. So in the problem there, they ask you that they were going to magnify your face 2.5 times. So it has to be concave. That means that the focal length is positive. Now, if you're magnifying this, the only way you're going to magnify with a concave mirror is if the image is virtual. So that question there, you have to think about all this. And then you just use the equation. They give you the magnification, and then you will realize, and I didn't ask this, I should have, if the image was upright or inverted. Since you have an image that is virtual, then it's also upright, by the way. The magnification is positive. So that means that minus Q over P, six centimeters, etc. That's how I knew. You also got points off if you run minus six, not minus six. The object distance is never negative unless you're talking about virtual object, right? But that's in lenses. In mirrors, well, also in mirrors you can have a virtual object, but that's in a combination. If you have a single lens or single mirror, object is always positive. So then you just have to do one over six minus one over 15 equals to one over F. Again, I don't think I took many points off for that question. Huh? And also, it wasn't worth a lot of points. Uh, 90 over 9 10 centimeters. Any questions about that? Or anything on the exam? I think that should be clear, right? Okay, so what I wanna do now is I want you to tell me what topics you need the most time to review. I think what I wanna do is I'm gonna stop it today there here, and then tomorrow I will do a long class. It will go from nine to 11. So I can cover most of the topics. I don't think I will go over optics. I think this should be more than enough. I will start with uh, magnetism and AC circuits, all right? And then I will go towards the first topics. But I want you to tell me right now what topics you want me to cover the most. So we will have two hours tomorrow to review. And then Wednesday you have your study day for the final. 
So what do you think you need to, re to review the most? Maybe things that we did at the beginning, uh, circuits, RC circuits, uh, LR circuits, AC circuits, induction, right hand rules, Uh, or if not, I just go over the two final exams. I have the final exam that you have in there, but I also have the final exam from two semesters ago, the departmental, I wanna go over that one. That one has 30 questions, all right? But actually, what you should be reviewing for sure, so let's make a list here. Is that second set of problems for the final um, review is that on the modules or in the files? Which are, uh, which problems? You said that we know about the final, pro the final exam samples that are in the files. You said there's a second set of exam? Of the second one, I only have the hard copy. Okay. Yeah, so I will just, it will, I'll just do it tomorrow. Right, so it's similar to the one that you have there. If you think about it, you have two basically in one because you have 60 questions in that one, but what I want you guys to remember, besides the question sheet, uh, topics that for sure are gonna be in the exam. All right, so yeah. But for the final exam, what topics you should expect for sure are circuits and everything we've talked about circuits, for example, RC, uh, LR, and AC circuits. So the whole concept of impedance, which everybody did good, so I'm not worried about that. Resonance. Right? Uh, Right hand rule, rules for fields, and then problems of course, of so magnetic fields, forces and induction. All right. Uh, then you all, we also did the application, so motors and generators, especially generators. Uh, capacitance. So capacitance. Uh, potential and energy. And then Coulomb's law, electric fields, so E fields, Coulomb's law. I want to emphasize there's going to be at least one problem where you have to use vectors, okay? This needs to be clear. I mean, everything was all optics, right? So all optics I will put here. Optics, so we're talking about reflection, mirrors, reflection, lenses, applications, combinations, maybe not combinations, but reflection and refraction, for sure. And one question about what we did today, interference and diffraction, right? Just one. And one question about electromagnetic waves. So chapter 21. So there are quite a few topics because inside each one there's quite a few things, right? Like circuits, you have quite a few sections there, right hand rules and problems. So of course, the particle in a, in a perpendicular magnetic field going in a circular motion uh, the direction of the induced current, 
um, the bar moving on the on a magnetic field. Study that. I want you guys to go over solenoids here as well. Yes, solenoids for sure. Inductance, so solenoids, and self-inductance or inductance. Capacitors, particles moving inside capacitor, right? Uh, conservation of energy, um, electric force, QE, magnetic force, QVB, or magnetic force due to a current. Uh, the time constants for RC circuits and LR circuits, right? Circuits with resistors only, equivalent, capa uh, resist equivalent resistance. Uh, split, uh, Kirchhoff, no, no Kirchhoff loss. I oh, don't no, no, ask Kirchhoff loss on the finance, so another topic that you don't have to worry, okay? But RC circuits for sure. Um, and then, well, refraction, reflection, mirrors and lenses, and I should put it here as well, optical instruments, so near point and far points. So near sightedness or near point problems, and the power of a lens. The whole exam is multiple choice. So it's not expected to be as difficult as a test, but you have two hours, right? So you have only nine to 11. It's the same deal that we normally give in a normal semester, all right? The advantage is that you don't have to do an scantron, which I always find in my real knowing. Uh, now, the other thing I want you guys to do and to take into consideration is that it's an option, you don't have to, but it's optional if you show me your work. Actually, no, let's leave that in there for now. I'm gonna ask tomorrow in the meeting because I know they wanted students to show their work uh, for the final. So I will let you guys know tomorrow or Wednesday, if you're gonna, have, if you're gonna be required, right? That won't change the dynamic of the exam, right? But we might require you guys to show your work. I wanna ask the other professor as well what he's doing for the final. Uh, last semester, I think I gave it as an option but they want you guys to show it this time because it's online and we wanna make sure that you know what you're doing, okay? Are there any questions about this? The topics for the final or any particular homework maybe? I have a quick question about what we learned today. So when do you use destructive and when do you use constructive for interference? Destructive is only when you have dark fringes. So maybe tomorrow I can do a problem like that, but every problem that we did today with the first order and second order was when M was an integer, one, two, three. If for example, they ask you to find the angle between the axis and the first dark fringe, by the way, that only happens in interference, right? Diffraction is always a constraint. Um, then you will use n minus one half. So let's put that over. If you have this, uh, the dark fringe, so this is your maximum here, and then your bright fringe is happening at n one, two, three, but you also have dark fringes. I wanna put this in here. One there, the second one there. So the first order, this is M equals to one for the dark and above the central maximum. So the equation you will use is like this. Again, D sine theta equals to M minus one half times lambda. But since M is equal to one, one minus one half, is one. That's for point one half. This one 
will be m equals to two. Two minus one half, three halves. That's it. Make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Right? But 90% of the problems are always with bright fringes because in real life, that's what you see. When you do this in the lab, you don't see the dark fringes. You see the bright fringes, but you know the dark fringes are there. Um, is there anything I'm forgetting that we did this? Okay, resistivity. Normally is not in the final either. All right. Uh, in fact, we have some time, so we can do this as well. Uh, if you look at the final sample, right, you will have a question like this, maybe not a triangle. You have an application of Coulomb's law, for sure. Uh, this one was used to ask about the potential, and you did this question in a quiz, by the way. Uh, I probably won't ask equipotential lines, that's going beyond the scope, but you can have an I ask this question in also in a quiz, right? So the circuit questions are not going to be very difficult, but you are going to have some, right? You can have a quiz. Uh, if you have a circuit with resistors, you will, have, you will also have one with capacitors, maybe asking the equivalent capacitance. A complicated question with resistors could be this, to find the equivalent uh, resistance. We can try and do this as well tomorrow, all right? There is your RC question there. Uh, okay, so there is a resistivity question in this exam, but in the last two years I've been here in Middlesex, we don't ask because it's only 30 questions now, right? Uh, there, look at this question here. They give you the speed of the proton and the radius, they ask you for the magnetic field. So R equals to MB over QB, application of formula. The force between the parallel wires, the force per unit length, another application of formula. So questions like this is what you should expect. Here's a Lenz's law equation there, or Faraday's law, Lenz's law question there. Remember the magnet and the coil. This one here. An electromagnetic wave question can be like this, theoretical questions, guys. There it is, like 28 and 29. All right. The phase angle of RLC circuit, the impedance, there it is. And then questions of mirrors and lenses, which are very easy, right? If you master this exam, and by the way, what is the final from last semester? I'm pretty sure it's here still. Final lecture, final exam, plus homework. Isn't it here? Let's see. Ah, uh, no, I shouldn't be seeing that. Uh, one to four assignments, final exam. Oh, here it is. If you guys are have enough time, click on here. Oh, it's not there anymore. So yeah, no, it's not here. That was the final uh, I gave last semester, but it's not, doesn't matter. You already have a sample there. That's, that's okay. All right. Uh, and it's gonna be different than this because this only had 20 questions. So um, there you are, guys. Tomorrow we will have two hours to do a whole review. All right, so be on time and make sure you guys bring any questions, okay? All right, so let's just stop the recording.